Hello, everyone. You're listening to the Paradigm Shifts podcast with your host, Keisha Kruger. I'm an organization development practitioner and executive coach working with leaders to create positive changes in the workplace using behavioral science. My personal mission, share science-based tools and leadership insights from the field that you can use in the workplace and beyond. Considering we spend about three quarters of our lifetime at work, there is incredible science and organizational psychology that could be used to rethink the way we work, lead, and ultimately live. Join me as I speak with thought leaders and business leaders in practice, unpacking light bulb moments for paradigm shifts. Hi, everyone. On this week's episode, we're sitting down with Terry Reeves. Terry is a social scientist and founder of Empower Health America, a research and education based consulting firm that provides leadership and team development training, OD consulting, executive coaching, and educational programming focused on empowerment and change. But before we get into the episode, I'm just here to share that we are closing in on the end of season one with this is the final episode. And season two will be back this fall with even more incredible guests, topics, and meaningful science about the world of work you do not want to miss. So if you haven't already, hit that subscribe button wherever you stream podcasts so that you can get alerts when our first episode of season two kicks off. Thank you so much for following along on this first season and the journey that we've had uh, for the last seven months of episodes. Really, that's incredible. We're ending in our 30th episode with Terry Reeves, and I am excited for season two to kick off. Thank you. Hi, Terry. How are you? Life is good today. <laughs> Amazing. I'm so, so grateful for you. And also, thank you so much for being here. I'm very excited to chat with you about change. We talk a lot about change on this podcast. And um, change is really the one constant in this life that we can depend on, right? Um, yes. So if there's one thing that we can work on getting getting really good at as humans is managing change, but not just in life, but in work as well. And and as a consultant, and you're also a social scientist, I mm-hmm. want to know from you kind of what changes are you seeing in organizations that they're facing the most today? That is a loaded and fabulous question. Um, you know, I, I pulled out, I wrote a white paper on stress on the new tsunami during COVID. And much like that wave on the front page, if you can see it, um, stress and the disruption that it created in the workplace, uh, we are still feeling, I think, the aftermath of that. You know, there are many things that we're challenged with and often challenge comes with opportunity for growth. So I don't necessarily look at change as something um, as negative. But often there is disruption and a bit of chaos and in the middle of that growth and we can pivot and get better at things and learn how to do things in different ways. But, you know, I think organizations are still trying to figure out how we can work effectively post COVID. I think we're also seeing the impact of mental health issues that we will continue to feel as we get post COVID and we have enough data and research that begins to point to things that perhaps were um, affected by all the isolation that we were um, not used to. And certainly the anxiety and stress that people that don't have the tools and skills to self-regulate left on their own and not being supported, people getting into the workplace for the first time and not being onboarded like normal and having to jump in into this virtual world. And in some cases, sitting next to their children at school and their husband or significant other working in a small space and masks and all the things that, you know, happened as a result of COVID. The one thing I do think, Keisha, is, you know, change creates challenge and challenge creates growth is it cracked, I think, a really important door wider around mental health Mm -hmm. and the importance of having healthy cultures, the importance of organizations looking at their employees as their greatest asset and not just helping them be productive, efficient employees, but how about healthy, happy, and whole, emotionally whole employees. And I'll just throw in the virtual piece because I think we're still trying to navigate back to what's that new normal. Do we provide flex time? Do we have people all come back? What about those people that have fear? So, you know, fear is debilitating. And I think, Smart companies are having transparent conversations about the truth 
and they're not afraid to discuss the undiscussables and they're being proactive to come up with how can we solve for these new challenges and let's make that a priority so that we can truly learn and grow from those things. Oof. So, so much change has happened to our world of work and determining the best way to work after the pandemic, through the pandemic, post-pandemic, right? Um, in a virtual world of work has probably what I've heard to be the biggest challenge. And then that put a huge spotlight on leaders and organizations to really focus on and hone in on how we can provide resources around mental health and mental health awareness to employees because that became a big prominent need as 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 we experience these shifts in our day-to-day lives, including our professional lives. And I imagine that the biggest change for organizations and leaders might be meeting those diverse needs of employees, whether it's individuals who want to stay at home and work, continue to work, or individuals who want to go back to the office. What are you seeing around that? So it's interesting. I was going to flip back to one thing you said because it was so powerful. When all this was happening and we were in the heat of it, Mm -hmm. there was this lean to leaders to help solve through it. And guess what? No one on this planet had ever experienced anything like this. Mm -hmm. And many of the leaders were feeling the exact same pressure and stress as the people that reported up to them. And I think the spotlight on wow, we might need to be able to proactively look at the learning from this. How can we help leaders manage through stressful times and give them more tools and support so that when we have to deploy this kind of like, oh my gosh, this is uncharted territory, then how can we be better prepared next time? So I didn't want to just flash by that because I think that was a real aha moment for companies. And in particular, how can we prepare our leaders with the toolbox and the skills needed. The piece that you leaned in after that around diversity and how everyone is responding to this in their own unique ways. And of course, it'd be great to say we're all created equal and we all respond and act the same, but that is in fact absolutely not true. And I think part of emotional intelligence is to be be self-aware. I think Richard Watts has has done a lot of great work around emotional intelligence. So it starts with self-awareness And then let me be aware of what's going on around me. And I think part of meeting people where they are is through discovery. Companies having more of a a conversation, a dialogue rather than a monologue and really seeking mutual understanding by making space to ask powerful questions and taking the time to get the answers from the people that are on the front lines. And I know that that takes more patience. It's not rolling straight to the bottom line, but it's certainly hitting what's called behavior. And last time I looked, happy, healthy employees are far more productive. They stay with organizations much longer. So in essence, it's a roundabout trip to the same bottom line, and that is there is financial benefit to be gained by making sure your employees stay healthy, well-trained, heard, right, valued, all the things we know that create a healthy culture. So I think Organizations are really taking a hard look at their human capital and looking at what kind of organization are we, who do we want to be, who do we want to attract, and how do we retain those talented people. And Mm. they're not all created equal, so we might have to come up with some awareness that one size does not fit all. Yeah, so I imagine that's kind of where the hybrid solution came to be, um, came about, right? It's we're trying to come up with this in the middle solution to meet needs on both ends, the business ends, the individual needs, because there's been this such spotlight on employee individual needs and also having a more holistic perspective on stress management and, yeah. and showing up as a human and understanding the human conditions and things that happen in the human condition. Um, so going back to the emotional intelligence and having self-awareness as leaders that we need to be able to focus on putting our people first and organizations and having more people-centric organizations. What does that look like in terms of gathering input, making employees feel heard, just to make it really tangible and practical for anyone listening in? Um, I, I'll put one out there that I know to be true, employee engagement surveys, but what are some other ways that we can close feedback loops within an organization? That's a that's a great question. And I think I'll, I'll talk about it in a real scenario 
rather than just kind of give something structural or academic. Um, I, during the pandemic, had to pivot my business completely. All of it was in person. And when COVID happened, I had to get really proficient on all these platforms where you present. And we now do with more ease now. Yeah, um, Technology still could drive us crazy, but for the most part, we all got shoved into the technological deep end, which that was kind of a faster learning curve for many people. And that was progress. So I'm celebrating some victories along the way. And I started presenting all over the country. And what you spoke about is, you know, stress and, and the human condition. And we started cracking. I mean, people were holding it together, but under this, this kind of direct stress, people started cracking. And I think organizations noticed that. So I worked for a company and still do. Um, it's an architectural firm called Studios Architect. They're in LA, San Francisco, DC, Washington, and um, and I'm missing one. Paris, can't forget that. Paris, that's a big one. And <laughs> this is in New York. And they invited me in, Keisha. You'll totally laugh at this because it's so like um, coaching, meet people where they are. And they're like, Terry, will you come in and do a lunch and learn on how to manage stress? And I'm like, absolutely. And I'm like, but that's not all I do. But I certainly believe at the core of my being that if we're not focused on the employees within organizations, we're missing an incredibly important pillar of what makes that organization work. And so I do a lot of mindfulness and I have for 25 years. It's just a personal practice, yoga, um, visualization. Breath work too, I believe, right? I mm -hmm. love breath work. Mm -hmm. And yes, and, and the breath is at the center of all of it, right? Everything. Logical impact with just breathing. It's free of charge. I know, and, and sorry to interrupt you, but no, no, no. I, I get nerdy about all of this stuff. And, and I love that you and I have this synergy and we can talk about this. But one of the things that's so overlooked about the breath is that as it relates to the neuroscience of the brain, if we are um, going up against something that's maybe a stressful situation, we're receiving difficult feedback. Mm -hmm. Everyone knows, or for the most part, we know we have amygdala hijack that comes into yeah. play when we are under stress. And so what that does is it shuts down the availability or accessibility to our prefrontal cortex. So that's the center where all the rational decision-making oh. is happening, the critical thinking. Yeah. And so one of the best ways to help your amygdala hijack stop or pause or come down is to practice good breath work, right? Yeah. And I love, love, love that, but also realize that we don't, teach that anywhere like where is that information oh, that's what i told with people like to make it real we didn't learn this in middle school you know we didn't learn it in college i'm not sure we had family conversations around these topics and mm -hmm. you know yoga certainly mindfulness training all of that if you're an athlete many athletes recognize the power of the brain and just breath and this body awareness and you're, you're, you're spot on. I mean, it's the fight, flight or freeze. And mm -hmm. our reptilian brain is the one that's like danger, danger, one at warning, warning. And our brain is constantly scanning for threat. It's constantly mm -hmm. scanning to make sense of the world around us. We're bringing in all this information and we layer our filters around that. And mm -hmm. if something is appearing threatening and it could be literally a stick on the ground that looks like a snake, or a boss walking into our office that we've had conflict with in the past where there may not be any conflict about to happen, but because that's been a reoccurring pattern, it just can put us into this hijack state. And, you know, I always talk about it when we breathe, like slowly, deeply, belly breathe, we are calming the central nervous system. And I won't get too geeky, but there's a lot of stuff that begins to wire differently and fire differently. Mm. We bring the prefrontal cortex back online because when we stop breathing and we get anxious, palms sweaty, heart racing, the blood shunts. I mean, literally stops flowing to our frontal cortex, like 80% of it. And so that breath brings flow back into the body. And it's so amazing because you'll talk about this and your people are looking at you like a deer in headlights. And because and they should. I mean, who's talked about this stuff before? But it's so incredibly powerful. Yeah. Anyone who is listening, just try to take some deep breaths and see, like, just reflect on how different your 
your state of mind is oh, after yeah. taking some deep breaths. Try for 30 to 60 seconds of just yeah. slow, deep breaths, belly breaths, as Terry says. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I imagine that all of this stress conversation really plays a role in is the changes that employees are facing is causing stress, right? As we've talked about, the leaders are noticing it for themselves, but also for their people. So what are you noticing in organizations as the most difficult part of change for people? In terms of just trying to manage stress and self-regulate? Or change in general, yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, anything that's going to create anxiety, whether it's a big internal change the organization's about to undergo change meaning i have to go back into the office and maybe i don't want to mm. change because i'm having or, or or stress because i'm having conflict so if we kind of go back to the change and i'm gonna wrap this back to um the trainings that i was doing because they were they were literally case of breath work or um, we meditated 225 architects for 15 minutes because leadership recognized the value of everybody pausing on a firm wide in a firm wide meeting, which was a great way to bring the organization together during this time of detachment. The surveys you mentioned is a great way to, to get the pulse of, of the organization, one on one proactive conversation. So all those ways are great ways to gather. But you think about the breath work and the power of that, and that leaned into more conversations not just about self-regulation and self-awareness, what's happening in my body, what information is my body telling me, but how does that apply to group dynamics? How does that apply to decision-making? How does that apply, right, to me feeling that anxiety, no matter where it's coming from, and noticing if I just take a moment to pause and process the information, and it might be my own information that I'm struggling with, because that saboteur can be in our own little brain, having all kinds of you know, conversations that may or may not be true. And then you lean that into group dynamics and you're like, okay, I'm not sure that person likes me on the team. But I'm too afraid to ask them, but I'm shutting down. I'm getting anxious. So mm. you begin to just think about how do I change that pattern? And, you know, you get a big corporate wide, you know, let's, let's institutionalize a brand new payroll system. I mean, things that just cause organizations big stress, these big operational changes, um, Let's redesign the org chart. I mean, you, you've seen all the <laughs> things that people, like everybody collectively is going like, oh my God. And so if we can all adopt this, let me pause to process. Let me have the right meaningful conversations. Let's not figure this out in a lickety split moment. Unless there's a, a real need, like firefighters, you don't have a, a lot of time to process. But most organizations, there's not a building burning down next to you. So this, this sense of urgency, this putting unnecessary stress, this need to move straight to action. I mean, I feel like if we can adopt this mindset of, and, you know, I've talked to you a little bit about the 5P change model, is how can I pause, how can I process either individually or with a team, and then how can I then plan more strategically? And then how do I pivot, collectively pivot, with the team or with my own internal, I've got this, and then proceed with a greater intentionality. And I think that's mindful living. And you can't be mindful unless you pause and breathe and reflect and ask really important questions and seek mutual understanding and not be afraid of challenging conversations. I mean, we've got to be able to discuss the undiscussables. And I know that was a a mouthful, but it just, you think about it self, you think about it team, and then you think about it organization wide. I mean, the pause and the breathing and the self-awareness, I mean, it runs through all of that. Mm. Companies are waking up to it. Not all of them, but I think the enlightened ones are, are and I think that's going to be a differentiator for organizations moving forward. Wow. I Can you imagine in a few years us having conversations or um chatting with leaders in organizations around how to be more mindful in decision making imagine learning oh like one of the workshops that we're teaching in a in a in an organization is how to develop your intuition for better better decision making right like those are the things it's like we're we're moving in that direction we are starting to bring the human 
the whole human to the workplace, which is, in in my opinion, in my perspective only, the shift that's so needed, the paradigm shift that's been needed for such a long time. And why we're here today, why we're here is to talk about how we help people better manage and get through and navigate change because back to what I said in the beginning, it's the one constant. We're going to have to do it anyways. We need to have some radical acceptance for that. So Terry, as as we pivot here a little bit, I want to ask you a little bit about your change model that you've designed called the 5P change model. And you, you mentioned it briefly, but if you can share a little bit more about how did it come about and take us through, maybe you have a story or something that you've, you've been able to apply that model that you can share with us. Yeah. I thank you. And, and I will, and you, you just keep saying such great things, Keisha. One thing that you mentioned about, you know, the human condition and radical change and you know, I think part of that radical change is for people with the emotional intelligence to make time and realize how important it is to become aware. And in that awareness, have some level of compassion for self and for others. And how can we have integrity in helping people move through change, especially if they're not equipped? And then what are the tools that we can provide them and how can we create an environment of curiosity and not fear, of hope and not judgment. So I believe that there is a huge um, paradigm shift on your podcast, which I love that name, is really re re um, framing the way we think about how we empower people and the way we run organizations, not running organizations by financial numbers and the bottom line, but how about the, the health and well-being of the employees? And I'm all about measuring outcome. Don't get me wrong. But those two are so interwoven. And I think with research and science, we're beginning to see more and more data that is truly supporting. If we train, if we do leadership development, if we do coaching, if we help people become more aware, if we work with people within behavioral dynamics in a group setting, we can be far more effective have less errors, less communication breakdown, equipped to deal with conflict much more effectively, more efficient. And last time I looked, more creative, joint decision-making so we get an outcome, that North Star that we can all agree to. So there's direction, a compass. All that stuff points to me right down to the bottom line, which should probably be going like this. So I just, I, I couldn't, walk away from 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 what you just planted but but yes i'll i'll, I'll shift to the that's five the points. ideal honestly like the ideal situation organization yes love it more please <laughs> right, right right and so the happy change model um i've been doing this type of work probably 25 years going in and institutionalizing change how do you galvanize people how do you create a vision how do you get buy-in? How do you communicate that? How do you measure it? So kind of organically, Keisha doing that. Um, along that same line, I've also been on my own personal quest of health and well-being. I had a lot of anxiety as a kid and really didn't have a lot of tools or support or coaching on how to manage that anxiety. So I went through a lot of peaks and valleys and tried a lot of different things and never gave up. Um, I always think about Carol Dweck and she's got this, you know, growth like mindset is if first you don't succeed, try, try again. And I started to figure out some answers and that was some deep soul searching, you know, probably a little bit of coaching and counseling, a little bit of skin in my knees and getting back up. And then I found that that exercise was really powerful for me, dancing, movement, becoming more connected to my body, viewing this home that I live in with more compassion and then leaning into the behavioral health side of things and doing yoga and mindfulness and meditating and understanding the power and the pause and not just clinically talking about, oh, the amygdala, like we were. I mean, there's clearly the science behind it, but actually being a Petri dish in my own life and doing this for 25 years. And so I've had this sort of parallel world. And when I went back to get my master's at Queens, um, probably the best decision I've ever made, plug for Queens, right? Mm -hmm. 
Queens Red. University of Charlotte for anyone who was yeah. <laughs> not yeah. from this area. Right. Yes, yes. Queens University of Charlotte. And it's the MSOD degree, and now it has a T for talent development. And, you know, being a social scientist and being able to peel the onion back and look at change requires the individual, the team, and the organization. And the organization could be the family, right? We find teams all around us, but having a sensitivity of how all those weave together sort of put me in this space of, I want to look at the models and the research that are out, the actions change model. I mean, there's just Cotter's eight stages to change. I mean, there's just a lot of research out there that supports like clearly steps that must be taken in order to help people move down the continuum. And I'm creative. I would self-identify with that. And I love thinking about simple ways to help people follow a process and things that are easy to remember. And I think about stop, drop, and roll. I mean, we think about acronyms and I'm like, all right, I'm going to create a change model that integrates my Eastern and Western knowledge and weave it together and use both Western, more heady scientific research. And then maybe this little bit of less, you know, I would say there's, there's more data now for sure, but it's an, an unknown area for more me. esoteric in a sense. Yeah. Touchy feely and, and how do you land the plane in corporate America with this touchy feely stuff? So we're going to find out. I, and so I came up with the 5P change model. I worked with Northeastern University quite a bit to um, validate the model. And the intention is to literally have something simple. We have to pause what is happening quite literally in this moment for me as a human. And I'll, I'll kind of walk it through a couple of different ways you could use it. So I am triggered and my default behavior would be to normally act. So how can I pause, breathe, do maybe a body scan, walk away, process my why. And, and by doing that, have a little bit more clarity. My medulla comes down and my frontal cortex comes back online. And now I'm thinking, a little bit more rationally. I question that saboteur, right? Because we have this internal dialogue often. And I feel as if this model has great application for just a human battling their own mind. And so after moving people through this self-regulation and self-awareness process, then I can plan. And then how do I plan more effectively? I ask questions. I do research. I do discovery. I get help. And then when I do that, I'm probably going to have enough information, facts, also, my gut, I mean, this passion that I have for whatever decision it is, what's my intrinsic why, and what are the facts around that? Then from those two places, we can move forward with much greater intention and the courage to actually pivot. Because what's my plan? There has to be, I mean, smart goals. We all know smart goals. Mm -hmm. Well, most of us do. But it's like be specific, time-bound. Um, it's got to be achievable. You got to be able to measure it. It's got to be time-bound, right? So how can I get really clear on my plan for myself? And this could be a decision like, where do I want to go to school? Do I want to get married? Do I want to buy a car? You know, how am I reacting to people in my life that keep triggering me? How can I process those things in a better way with structure? And one is more self-regulation because I'm triggering right here in my own body. And the other is how can I use it as a human as I'm planning to make big decisions in my life? And they don't also have to be giant. But I'm not just going, oh, I have a thought, I'm going to go straight to action. I think that getting the information has given us more, taking the time, getting and gaining more information internally, externally if needed, then that allows us to plan and pivot with greater intention. And I believe it allows us to move through life in a more mindful way. And the reality is sometimes we get a barrier, right? So we pause and we process again and we plan. So it is not linear, right? It is a cyclical, cyclical dynamic. And I'll use an example with our studios. Again, I'll, I'll just stay with them as a firm. They wanted to redesign their um, review process. And so I met with the executives and they shared their goal and the presenting problem as they viewed it. And I'm like, we are taking an intentional pause because this is important to the company. Let's articulate it. Now let's process everybody's perspectives because what you're defining as 
maybe the issue may not be what the other person. So let's ask questions and let's seek some mutual understanding. And let's not just do that at the C-suite level. Let's, let's do some conversations with all of these offices, right? Subcultures, slightly different. The process was not the same in each of the offices. So let's process. What are people doing in the different offices? What are, what are best practices? How are people feeling about that? Let's do a survey. And, and this wasn't something that just happened in two weeks. I mean, we know a major change like that takes months and months and months. So that ability to recognize that that processing, that discovering, that information gathering allowed us to make a much more informed decision. And we probably recognized that that wasn't the only issue that the review process needed to be changed, but the why it needed to be changed became clearer and the how it needed to be changed became clearer. And what we could expect as outcomes became clearer so that we're not just changing for change sake. We're getting buy-in, we are getting clarity, we're defining the why, we are moving together collectively. This is what the plan looks like. Let's get really clear. Here's the timeline. This is how it's going to be communicated. This is how we're going to measure it. We're going to make sure everybody is, you know, at least aware of the benefit to them because people don't like change and you know that. So like, this is going to really require a lot of people to do different things, which is like, oh God, more work for me, maybe, or that's new. What does that form really mean? I don't understand that word. So we had to do a lot of communicating around what words meant because mm. we were not just looking at skills but we were looking at behavioral competencies. Oof. So very different, yeah. very coaching and its approach, which was brand spanking new. So all of this prep work and all of this communication on the front end, discovering and getting clarity really allowed us to jointly design and plan something. And as a result, we deployed it, we pivoted, right? And we deployed it and it worked really well and we measured the outcome and we will continue to proceed forward. That's the fifth P is the proceed doesn't always mean forward. Sometimes the proceed leads you right back to pause. <laughs> right, back. right back to pause. And, you know, if you're looking for constant improvement, I don't think we ever sit still. I think the measuring and inspecting and ensuring that the choices we've made are really being institutionalized. And, you know, I think we learned, Keisha, it wasn't the perfect solution, but we hit about 75% of our goals and then wow. we saw what was less well-developed. Well, first we celebrated the victories, what was well-developed psychologically, right, as an organization. And then we focused on these are the areas that need refinement. So let's now take this second wave of change. We don't have to push the giant boulder up the hill now. It's a smaller rock. Yeah. Less, you know, work needed, but yet more work needed. So you can kind of see how this process allows us to move through the change process and it does involve that self-regulation because when I sit with organizations, often I take a level set. I'm like, let's just stand in the room and let's get real clear on why we're here. And I want to see you and hear you and value you. I don't want to move straight into decisions and action and hearing only from one person. Let's just make sure we're being mindful of the collective consciousness so we can create a collective solution. You know, and, and it's not always possible. Sometimes Leaders have to make a unilateral decision, and that's critically important sometimes. But when we have the ability to take the time, and it doesn't mean we land in these for months and months, but we at least step into each each of these P's, and we land there for the appropriate amount of time, I, I truly believe outcomes are significantly better. And I use it in my coaching models, too, when I'm yeah. coaching leaders and teams. Yeah, I'm hearing that you can you can probably apply this on an individual level, a team level, and an organizational level in terms of change, right? So the coaching, the managing your people, managing your teams as a manager, and then also um, anyone who is in like a change practitioner, OD practitioner role. Here's, if, if you don't mind, where I can share that I see some unique positioning around your model because it's the first time you've actually walked me through it on this level. The intentionality in your first P, between your first P and your second P, I think is so critical. And the reason is because imagine we go into the process, right? We go into the process step and we are immediately going in and collecting information and gathering information. 
going back to what you said earlier when it when we were talking about the con- the filters that we put on the lens in which we are looking at things right our perception of our reality and how we are interpreting this process and that information we're collecting if you didn't have that first p that pause we're bringing all the conditioning all of the program beliefs that we've kind of had going you know going on in our lives or maybe through our days or that month or that year being applied to the way that we're perceiving the process information, that information we're collecting from the organization. So that pause first allows you to separate my stuff from what this person. And and so I imagine that it helps lessen projection when they are um, interpreting the collective information. Is that right? Yes. I mean, you think about just pausing and breathing and landing in the room, turning the cell phone off, you know, Kind of this is the intentionality behind this. Let's intrinsically, just for a moment, think about how this will impact you and us as an organization. And let's find that North Star that we can mm-hmm. all, like get excited about. And then let's let's talk about our whys. What's your attachment to this solution or you know the goal? And what barriers are you? What's coming up for you? Mm-hmm. And think in that space of pause and just suspending judgment and really creating a safe environment, quite literally by being still, breathing, fully present, actively listening, creates an environment where people are less dense and less judgmental. And we can coach people to use these tools that you're expressing, because I think the P, the first one, the pause, is often what is not as well developed for organizations because they just are used to getting into boardrooms and they start talking and making decisions and they don't check in with self first. And there's so much information that we need to synthesize in order to be clear enough to step into a conversation from a neutral perspective. And, you know, there's a lot of fear. I mean, the fear can really inhibit creativity. It can, it can inhibit um, someone making a recommendation because they don't feel safe it could be a brilliant solution and to feel seen and valued really requires people to feel seen and valued if you don't do that by telling people what to do or or at them um just creating some space and holding equal space for everybody so it's it's different, right? I mean, it is a little different, but also I love the the aspect of just calling out those fears, confronting those fears and really checking in. I, I when you, you gave that example of like just going to the boardrooms, getting the information and making decisions, it's like, yeah, that is what we do. But if we were to stop and say, okay, before we go and get information, how are we feeling about this change? Like checking in with yourself, checking in with that team and saying like, are we, if someone's feeling like they're afraid people are going to leave because of the change, or they're afraid that it's going to rock the boat too much, or clients aren't going to like it or whatever it is, maybe for themselves, they are low in capacity and they just don't feel ready to be able to take on this change as a personal thing, right? It's like, I'm showing up, um, in this team, in this organization, and I don't feel like I have the capacity to give the energy, the resources to give this change. Let's talk about that. And then before we make any decisions, because that's kind of where we get ahead of ourselves. Yeah. In, you know, I think about we live as a society in our heads. I mean, technical, transactional, and that has been taught as efficiency. And the reality is when we allow ourselves to pause, we begin to access gut feeling, emotions, the language of the body, sensation. And that's a lot of information that can bode really well in personal awareness. It can shift behavior. And I I think we need both. I mean, it's, we've got to have the facts. We've got to be efficient. We've got to have a timeline. We've got to take the steps, but how about let's understand the intrinsic why our own fears, our own And then solve for those things by having these transparent conversations, making space for that so we can collectively move forward with less fear, Um, abundance, right? Because scarcity doesn't really create great change. It doesn't allow the mind to think as clearly. It's laced with fear, which goes back to the amygdala cranking and the frontal cortex not 
functioning as well. And Keisha, I do see it. I see people shut down all the time because they're afraid that they're going to be judged or they're afraid that they won't be able to learn the new tech technology. And it's like, it's okay. We can't solve for what we don't know. And if you're not pausing yourself as a human to figure out what you need and express that, then how can we solve it? And so the pause is a spot that, you know, I would say organizations are warming up to more and more because there's more science. And there's more science and there's more practitioners out there that are preaching it and practicing it and modeling it. And thank goodness for that. Um, Yes. Wow. Can I tell you a kind of a cool story real quick? Yes, please. So it it just is one of those powerful things I've ever witnessed. And, you know, it's it's easy to go into an organization that has a leader that thinks about mindfulness and introduces it and makes space and time for it, even if people are not aware of it or maybe a little bit like, what is this? It's not like you're just telling people about mindfulness when you take them through the practice of mindfulness they feel it. So it it takes the need for fact and figures kind of out of the equation because we're our own, um, I guess, experiment, right? Because we are feeling the impact of it. And so Todd um, is is the CEO of Meritus Now Studios. And I've been doing executive coaching with him for a while and we've integrated mindfulness. And I I think I maybe mentioned this to you. Part of the change was stepping out of a 30 year career with studios into a new unknown, right? He's not been CEO emeritus yet. And so what does that change look like? And then how can we integrate mindfulness to help him move through that? Well, fast forward, not only did he go through that shift, but he went through a heart transplant. And you talk about significant paradigm shift on every level. And it was, it's, we don't have enough time today, but to just talk about how mindfulness was so critical during that pre and during and post healing new heart quite literally and just becoming familiar and aware to what he needed to heal so he just got awarded on the howard tack medal university of cincinnati two weeks ago congratulations to him i know right wow Um, he's won a gazillion awards but just a dynamic human and a great leader and he um wanted to do something different He's an architect, very creative. He was, I want to create an experience rather than, you know, a hundred of my colleagues and friends and, and, and just people in his life, family descending on this big event where people stand up and just blah, 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 and just talk, talk. I mean, good speeches, very appropriate. He goes, I want to do something different. I want to create an experience. He said, will you come down, Terry, and open the program up with a mindfulness exercise? And I was like, Okay, this is going to be great because now we're, we're reaching the masses. I'm not in a mindfulness studio or a yoga studio or working with a CEO that's open to it. He is now bringing this, what he called a gift, to share with the audience. And so it was a small dance, well, not small dance theater. It was a practice dance theater with a full stage at Cincinnati. And we took it dark and spotlighted and basically I came on and sort of put it, put some framework around it, took them through a one minute heartbeat where it's literally like the heartbeat was going on in the background. Then a 10 minute body scan. Then we had Tibetan bowls for the vibration because we're seven. Wow. Before, so all of this that we bring in through sound it impacts us and then closed it at the end. And basically it was Todd's gift to them. I went to a cocktail party that night and the next day, at a luncheon and it, it people were like we never experienced anything like this and it opened everybody up to be fully present we just need one of him in every organization in the country so, just such an interesting thing to share so beautiful something i've never experienced but to see the ripple mm-hmm. effect of that to the audience some people familiar with mindfulness many many not but the powerful impact that it had and the way it shifted the energy for the rest of the program um, and how you can take new things out to the world. And when you're not fearful about doing that, wow, there, that's, that's where we can make great change is not to be fearful of stepping into a place of unknown. Yeah, that courage, that vulnerability is such a strength 
in leadership and just admire leaders who can step into that space. I think this entire discussion is going to be a paradigm shift for a lot of people tuning in. Um, it might take a second listen. So listen back again to Terry's process. L listen back into um, the impact that she shared as having on organizations as as we step into practicing more pause, processing. Tell me more. Pro okay, pause, process, plan, okay. pivot, proceed. Is that right? Did I get it? Yes. You got it. Eight awesome. All right. Yeah. Okay, good, good. Um, so here's the last question I have for you as we wrap up, because believe it or not, we are here at the end and everyone knows what question I'm going to ask. And this is, what is the most recent paradigm shift that you've experienced? That I have experienced. Keisha, I would say probably bearing witness to how well-received something that is that is foreign right that's not wow. mainstream that's not something that people are really familiar with and to be able to step into that unknown me and trust the process and see the outcome it was more of a okay i'm not going to hold back this is really impacting people's lives in a powerful way it may be met with you know the eyebrow lift because people are uncertain, but there's science behind it. It's not something that is esoteric and only the people that can sit in the lotus position should pause and breathe. This is a universal phenomenon. It doesn't cost a dime. And it only takes our own body breathing in and out with great intention. It's so simple, but yet we don't do it. And, you know, the whole process is important, right? But I realize that there is power power in the pause. And that is a deal, deal breaker in terms of, I think, helping us move change to even a deeper level. So it, it just was sort of affirmation that sometimes I'm, I'm a little uncertain, is the world ready for this? And, and, and I, and I, and I know now they are. Well, thank you so much for your ability to surrender and trust in the process, because that is proving as a proof of concept for others to follow in your footprint and really, really appreciate the impact that you're making on the world of work, on organizations and on individual people's lives. Thank you so much, Terry, for being here today. Yes. And I, I want to give you a compliment back. Oh. Patience, I've watched you and I have so much admiration that doing a podcast, as you know, is no simple feat. It's mm -hmm. very time consuming, but I know this is a passion project for you. And I really value you as a practitioner, having a platform, sharing this information so that we can. It's a ripple effect, right? Yeah. And the more we can celebrate that change can be done with great intention, it might create disruption, but we can help people get there with strategy and intention. And you're giving all kinds of great information out, sharing, you know, allowing people a platform to share their passion as well. So mm -hmm. thank you for that. And I'll package up some stuff to some of the things that I've referenced today and share that forward with you in case some of the listening audience and people that are visually watching this, that that may be um, kind of support the learning and, and the information that we yes. share today. But I'm grateful for you, last man. Thank, thank you, you so me. much. That yeah. feels so good. And I really appreciate the kind words of encouragement and support. And yes, everyone who is listening and tuning in, there will be all of the resources and more such as how to contact Terry, how to follow her services and be in touch with her all in the show notes. So be sure to visit that uh, if you haven't already. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a great one. Thank you so much for tuning into this week's episode. If you enjoyed this conversation, don't forget to leave a review, rate, and subscribe wherever you're listening. If you know a business leader in practice or friend who you think would be interested in this episode, please consider sharing it with them. I am so grateful for your support. For more updates, you can follow us at Paradigm Shifts Podcast on Instagram. See you on the next episode.